Well, hello, Abundant Life Church. I hope everybody is doing good. Uh, this is being pre-recorded for our Wednesday night Facebook Bible study. Uh, Pastor Dan and I today on Wednesday are out of town for a funeral. And uh, so I would not be able to be back in time to be able to meet with you live. So I pre-recorded this for you. Uh, I have just a couple announcements. We're going to get right into the lesson. So if you need to grab your study guide or a coffee or something, do that now. A couple of short announcements. You have plenty of time for that. Otherwise, you could pause it if you need to since we're not live and then just pick it right back up. But I do want to encourage you, finding that this video is pre-recorded and not live, I still want to encourage you, stay with us and watch the video tonight. Uh, do this lesson so we'll all be on the same page, and I'm confident this lesson tonight is going to encourage you. Uh, don't forget Sunday services this weekend, 9 and 10.30 a.m. for the morning service, 6.30 p.m. for our evening worship. Uh, I will be preaching this weekend. Uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, we had unbelievable service, just incredible move of God. In last Sunday's service, when I was in Arkansas, I was able to be with my mom for Mother's Day. Uh, as many of you know, at, our, at least at our Abundant Life Church family, I was born on Mother's Day in 1965. I'll save you the math. I'm 56. Uh, every seven years when my birthday's on Mother's Day, I do all that I can to try to be with my mama. And uh, my home church, I was honored that they asked me to come and preach to make that possible. And so it was just a really great day. A couple of people were saved. It was just an unbelievable day in the presence of the Lord. So uh, thank you for that, for praying for me. Pray for me for this coming weekend at our church. Friday night's youth Bible study online, 7 o'clock, London Life Church. Uh, a uh, YouTube channel is where they'll find that, 7 o'clock every Friday night. And uh, that's it. So hope all of you mamas had a great Mother's Day. Let's dive right into the lesson. We are in week 7 in our study of the book of Philippians. Tonight, we're in chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. And we're going to be talking about the in and out of of Christian living, the in and out of Christian living, okay? So Paul, in the first 11 verses of chapter 2, he has showed you and I, he's given you and I, rather, a command to be like-minded with one another, put other people's needs ahead of ours. He called us to have this mind uh, to, in our own mind that is also in Christ Jesus. So, and then he gave us the example of what that looks like in the life of Jesus, all the way down through to verse number 11. So the question is, how do we obey these commands that Paul just gave us and follow the example of Jesus in these previous verses. How do we do that? Paul answers that for you and I in verses 12 through 18 when he talks about the in and out of Christian living. Three truths that I want to give you. Let's look at them together. Your study guide has all of them, uh, so follow along. If you did not get a study guide, send us your email and we'll be glad to add you to that. If you just forgot to print it, I will give them to you simple, straightforward, and give you a chance to put them into your note app or write them on the notepad that you have in front of you. Three truths about the in and out of Christian living. Truth number one, there is a purpose to achieve. There is a purpose to achieve. Let's read chapter 2, book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 12, then verses 14 through 16. Chapter 2, verse 12, then verses 14 through 16. Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 14 through 16. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Paul here begins by carefully informing the church at Philippi and us today that we, that we, are responsible before God for our own salvation. Not as in earning our salvation, but we're responsible with attaining that salvation by asking God to forgive us of our sins, by acquiring that. Then we're also responsible for maintaining our salvific relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Paul was letting them know that they could not lean on him. Paul said in verse number 12 there, he says, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Paul's saying this, look, you can't be a Christian because you know me and I'm a Christian. No more than a child is a Christian because his mom and dad are Christians. Um, Keith Green, years ago in the 80s, of the 70s and 80s, um, he would say at these festivals that he would uh, sing at and preach at, he would say, uh, you, you being a Christian just because you go to church is the same thing as trying to say that you're a hamburger because you go to a hamburger store or that you're a car because you stand in a garage. No, you have to have that relationship yourself. Paul said it has nothing to do with him. He tells you the good news of salvation, but it's important that you acquire that relationship with God, then you maintain that relationship with him. Now, there's this phrase in verse number 12 that a lot of theologians have discussed over the years, and we hear it often in pulpits and with varying uh, nuances to it. And I just want to give you some simple, straightforward truth about it. And that is that phrase in verse number 12 where Paul says this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation does not suggest to work for your salvation. The Bible's very, very clear. We are saved by grace, not by works. The Bible's very, very clear that it's only God that can save us and no one else. To begin with, uh, Paul, when writing this letter to the church at Philippi, he's writing to a group of Christians already. These are people that are already saints. Go back and look in chapter 1, verse number 1, the very beginning of the book. Paul identifies them as saints. They are believers in God, followers of Jesus Christ. Okay, So they've already trusted Christ for salvation, and they've already been set apart by God to serve Him. So Christians are the ones being addressed here. So this isn't a question of whether you're saved or not. This is a question of what you are doing with your salvation. Charles Swindoll, Chuck Swindoll, put it this way in one of his writings, quote, The Philippians are to work out their salvation not in the sense of earning it, but expressing the reality of their salvation through practical obedience and selfless humility. He goes on later to say this, The emphasis is on sanctification, that being learning to live more righteously, and not on justification, that being declared righteous by God. So this is an issue of how you live out the salvation that has already taken place in your life. In chapter 2, verses 14 through 15, Paul contrasts the life of the believer with the lives of those who live in the world. Unsaved people complain and find fault, according to what Paul wrote here in the previous verses, but Christians are to rejoice. The culture around us, the Bible says in this same verse, is crooked and perverse, but the Christian is to stand straight because we measure our life by God's word. That is the perfect standard. The world is a dark place, dark because of evil, but Christians shine as bright light. And the world has nothing to offer, but in verse 16, but the Christian holds out the word of life, the message of salvation through faith in Christ. And so here in just these few short verses, Paul's trying to help you and I understand what it means once we come into this relationship with Jesus Christ, when we've been forgiven of our sins, it is in that moment then that we begin to live out this Christian life. Uh, from our place of salvation. So instead of complaining and disputing as Christians, we are to strive to be blameless and harmless. Paul talks about that. Look at it again in verse number uh, 14 and 15. Do all things without complaining and disputing. That's what the world does and what Christians should not be doing. Then he says this, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. So instead of complaining and grumbling and disputing, we are to strive to be blameless and harmless. Let's look at these for just a minute. Complaining. Literally in the Greek, it means to talk under your breath, to mumble and to gurgle uh, is what it means there. So this is the people that uh, somebody says something and they don't like it. It's like, well, yeah, yeah, try saying that to my face. You know, that kind of a thing. That's what's being literally is what Paul is talking about here from the original text, complaining. Also, disputing. 
This word disputing speaks of ill-natured controversy. It speaks of someone stirring up dissension and causing of strife. Stirring up dissension and causing of strife. Paul said that's not supposed to be a part of us. Remember, Paul said to be like-minded, to have this unity in the body of Jesus Christ, to have the same mind that's in Christ, to be the same mind that's inside of us. And so that's the reason that is not what the believer is to be doing or, listen to me, to even give energy to or to engage in. No complaining, no disputing. Instead, strive to be blameless and harmless. Blameless here means free from defect. It is an allusion in the Greek back to the sacrificial system where a lamb before it was offered needed to be found without defect, needed to be found blameless. Jesus was the blameless lamb of God. That's what's being talked about here. And then harmless, very interesting word here. It is the sense of unadulterated and it was used commonly in Paul's day when it speaks of being unadulterated, it was attached to description of wine that had not been watered down. So uh, like, for example, in the South where I grew up at, uh, sweet tea is the big thing. In fact, you, when I was a kid, now everybody's got all kinds of flavors and everything else. When I was a kid, if you ordered a tea anywhere in any kind of diner, it's a given. It was sweet. It just was. And I'm talking syrupy sweet. And it wasn't just sweet, but it was really dark even. I mean, you'd, you'd put it up and shine it up in a light and you'd wonder if you were having a Coke or iced tea. Very, very dark. It was undiluted. It was made strong and undiluted. That's what's being talked about here. We're to be harmless. That means undiluted by the things of the world, not to be influenced by the things of the world. What are those? In the media context, complaining and disputing. So we're not to even be watered down by those things in our Christian life. In other words, as we follow God to achieve this purpose of being blameless and harmless in our lives, we become better witnesses in a world that desperately needs Jesus Christ. Now, it is important that I want you to notice here, and that is this. This purpose is achieved, look in verse number 15, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. One Bible commentator in my studies put it this way, Christians live in a real world rather than growing in a greenhouse setting. What's being talked about here when Paul said in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, you and I live in this world. You and I live around people who are crooked and perverse, evil people. We live in a very wicked, wicked world, but it's not supposed to influence us. It's not supposed to change who we are. Instead, we should still continually each day strive more and more to be this blameless, harmless follower of Jesus Christ that we're called to. And then Paul puts it this way very clearly. Not only do we do this in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, but it has a specific reason. It has a specific way that it, it plays out. It has a specific look to it. And Paul said this, among, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Look at that again. It's right here in verse number 15. Among whom you shine as lights in the world. This is an echo of the words of Jesus in Matthew 5. You'll want to write this down. I didn't give you this verse in your study guide. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16, where Jesus said this, you, speaking to you and I, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And that's what Paul's talking about. When we live differently, the whole world around us is living, complaining, and disputing. When we live differently in a harmless and a blameless way, when we live for Jesus Christ according to his standard and the standard of God's word, when we do those things, we not in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, we naturally become someone who shines as a bright light. When I was a little kid in church, we used to sing a little chorus in kids' church that said, talked about this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. 
hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. You know the chorus. Many of you are singing it right now. You won't be able to get that head out, that song out of your head all evening. You'll go to bed singing that in your head. Uh, but there's a great truth in that. We're to be that kind of a light. And when you live for Jesus Christ, I'm just here to tell you, when you live sold out for Jesus Christ, you will stand out in the culture in which you are a part of. Okay, so that's the first truth. Remember, Paul, I told you he's going to give us three of those today. The first one is there is a purpose to achieve. Second truth that I want to give you, there is a power to receive. There is a power to receive. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. I want to read it to you in the New Living Translation. It brings it out really, really well. In fact, uh, in reality, when I studied in the Greek, it brings it out even a little closer to the original language when it says this, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. I'm going to read that for you again. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Him. You see, while verse number 12 talked about our human responsibility, verse number 13 talks about and deals with, explains for you and I rather, the divine responsibility. Verse 12 was our responsibility to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, to work it out, not to earn it, not anything else at all. It's already ours when we ask Jesus for it, but to live out that salvation that's in us. But then verse number 13 begins now to say, okay, we've done our part. Here's God's part in this process. It's the reason why we're referring to this lesson as the in and out of Christian living. The inward part, that inward part is what only God can do. When we ask him to forgive us of our sins, he's faithful and just, 1 John 1, 9, faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But then also there's that aspect, that's the inward work. Then there's that outward work, which is you and I, that we live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation as not complaining and disputing, but rather harmless and blameless so that we will be a bright light in a dark world for Jesus Christ. Paul made that very, very clear for you and I. You see, the principle that Paul is teaching here in this second one that I've labeled, there's a power to receive, this principle is teaching here this, quote, God must work in us before he can work through us. God must work in us before he can work through us. Verse 12 and verses 14 through 16, we talked about God working through us, what this outward manifestation of the inward work of salvation looks like. Now let's take a closer look at that inward work of Jesus Christ. You see, because God is more interested in the workman than he is in the work. Here's why. If the workman is what he ought to be, the work will be what it ought to be. I'm going to repeat that again. If the workman is what he ought to be, the work will be what it ought to be. In other words, if we're loving Jesus and we're following him and we only care about him and doing what pleases him and what, what he wants us to do, the work, the life that we live is going to take care of itself. We will be every day striving to live harmless and blameless. It'll be our motivation to please God. Okay? As we submit ourselves to the working of God's Spirit, He gives us both the desire and the power to accomplish His will. Too often, though, too many Christians obey God only because of pressure on the outside and not power on the inside, according to Warren Wiersbe, a great Bible teacher. I want to read that one again also. Too many Christians obey God only because of pressure on the outside and not power on the inside on the inside. I see this even as a pastor. Uh, there are so many things that we should do as believers in Jesus Christ that we don't do. But too often, the things that we are doing, we do it because of Christian peer pressure. We all know that God's word is very, very clear. We're supposed to attend church. But then we don't attend church. We also know very clearly God's called us to pray, uh, to be men and women of prayer. We're going to talk about that later in this same truth here. Men and women of prayer, but on a once a month prayer meeting, then those people are nowhere to be found. We know what we're supposed to do. We just don't do it. 
But we do do certain things because of outside pressure. We know if we don't show up at a certain church event or we don't act a certain way, and all of that stuff then tends to legalism because we're doing it for the wrong reason. We're not doing it to please God. We're not doing it to please Him and for His good pleasure. We're not doing it to be harmless and blameless. We're not doing it because we're followers of Jesus. We're not doing it to be lights and a bright, uh, bright lights in a dark, evil world. We're doing it because we feel like we have to do it because somebody might notice. So Paul is addressing that here when he talks about there is a power to receive. You see that the power that works in us is the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So what tools does God use by His Holy Spirit to work in our lives? There are many of them, but we've narrowed it down to three for our study tonight. Three tools that God uses to help you and I to let the power of God work in us and through us for His good pleasure. Number one is the Word of God, the Bible. Write this down. Oh, I gave you this one in your study guide. I didn't write out the verse because there wasn't enough space, but I gave you the reference. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Paul wrote this. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because, notice this, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which also effectively works in you who believe. Now, from this verse, I want us to see three things from this verse. We're going to break it down. I'm sharing with you three things that are going to be the Word of God you see in your study guide, prayer and suffering. These are three tools that God uses to help you and I in this power of God operating in our life. This power to receive, but power to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? From this verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Verse number 13, we see three things. First of all, we must appreciate the Word of God. Appreciate the Word of God. Not treating it the way we treat the words of men. When you quote anybody else in this world, even a phrase from a preacher, you noticed even tonight, even already, just in this study guide, uh, just in this uh, brief time in this study, I've quoted a couple of my favorite Bible teachers, quotes that they've made, the way, truths that they've given to wrap up something that God's Word is saying. But as truthful as it is of what they said, Ultimately, it's God's Word that I believe above all other things. And we must have an appreciation for that, for God's Word, that we not treat it the same way we treat the words of men. It's different. God's words are divine and eternal. Man's words are temporal. And at some level, always lack, as truthful as they are, always still lack the divinity that is only found in God's Word, the power that's only found there. So we're to appreciate the word. Number two, we're to appropriate the word. This means received the word of God. That's the exact phrase that Paul talked about here, when they received the word of God. This means much more than listening to it or even reading and studying in it. It is taking in the Word of God, that I heard it. You know, the, you know, from the pulpit, it's quite a view when you preach to people. It really is. I don't get distracted easily by things at all. I'm someone not easily distracted much. In fact, in fact very seldom ever uh, do I get distracted. But I do get to observe a lot of things that are going on. People cleaning out their purses, men clipping their nails, uh, people texting their friends, shopping on Amazon, watching cat videos, uh, all of the different things. Are they hearing God's word? Yeah, they're hearing God's word. Are they receiving God's word? I'm a little uncertain about that one. With such a distraction and multitasking, are you really receiving the word of God? You heard it, but are you really receiving it for the truth that it is? Is your face giving up the emotion that's going on inside your heart with this interaction with the Word of God? So we are to appreciate the Word. We're also to appropriate the Word. And number three, we're to apply the Word of God. It works only in those, here's the phrase, who believe. That's what Paul talked about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Those who receive the Word of God and those who believe the Word of God. It's that hearing and doing the Word of God that we talk about a lot from James chapter 1. Okay, So one of the tools that God uses for us in receiving this power of the Holy Spirit and it operating in our life, number one is the Word of God. Number two is prayer. Prayer. 
Number two is prayer. It's the most simple of all of these tools and the one least deployed in the life of a believer. Least deployed in the life of a believer. Ephesians 3.20, Paul says this, and I gave you this reference, but was did not have the space to type out the, the verse. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, here it is, according to the power that works in us. Remember the truth here is to receive a, the power uh, that we're talking about, it, there is a power to receive. That's what we're talking about. And the Holy Spirit is closely related to the practice of prayer in our lives. The Holy Spirit is closely related to the practice of prayer in our lives. In the Bible and in church history, the people God used were people who prayed. Okay? Third one, Word of God, prayer. Number three, suffering. Nobody's going to like this one. Nobody lines up and says, suffering. Yeah, amen. Preach it, brother. No, but it's vitally important that we understand it. Suffering is one of the tools that God uses for the power of the Holy Spirit to not only abide in our life, but work through our life and operate in our life as we serve God. The Spirit of God works in a special way in the lives of those who suffer for the glory of Christ. 1 Peter, I gave you the reference, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. Paul talks about it in, or Simon Peter there, talks about that in depth to a church. Now remember, when Simon Peter wrote 1 Peter, he was writing to the dispersed church, and they were dispersed because of persecution. Nero had burned the city of Rome, blamed it on the Christians. Christians were being arrested, martyred. They were being dragged into arenas and fed to hungry animals for entertainment. Their bodies were being put on poles in the city streets and lit on fire to light the streets at night. This is a very difficult time in the life of the church. And Paul said this, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Here it is. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And for the sake of time, I'm going to leave the other seven verses for you to read. But Simon Peter there is saying that suffering, when we suffer for Jesus Christ, when we suffer because we follow Jesus Christ, it works something inside of us. It makes us more resilient. It makes us more committed to God. It draws us closer to God. It causes more dependence upon God. And it's actually one of the tools that God uses in our lives along with prayer and the Word of God for you and I to understand that there is a power to receive, the power of the Holy Spirit that works in and through us. The third and final truth that I want you to see, and that is this, number three, there is a promise to believe. Back in Philippians chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. Holding fast the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. What is this promise to believe that Paul's talking about here? What is this promise? That promise is this that joy comes from submission. In the life of a believer, joy, and remember the book of Philippians is all about joy beginning to end, that joy comes from submission. Jesus said this in Luke 14, verse 11. I don't, not, I don't think that one's in your study guide. Luke chapter 14, verse number 11. Jesus says this, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. When we submit ourselves to putting other people's needs ahead of ours, remember the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter two? This is in response to that. This is the in and out of Christian living in response to the submissive mind that, that Christ had that we should have also is in response to how we are to treat one another in the first four verses of Philippians chapter 2. All of this is in response to that. And that is that we submit to these things. And see, there's a twofold joy that comes to the person who practices verses 1 through 11. Those first 11 verses, there's a twofold joy that comes to the person who does that. Here it is. There is a joy hereafter in the hereafter. 
That's in verse 16, chapter 2, verse 16. And there is a joy here and now. So for you and I, it's a win-win. There's a joy in the hereafter when we submit ourselves to God. You see, God is going to reward those who have been faithful to Him. And listen to this, Matthew 25, 21. Put that down, Matthew 25, 21. God is going to reward those who have been faithful to Him. And here it is, and this is a quote from that verse. The joy of your Lord will be part of that reward that God gives you. When He tells us to come into His kingdom and to receive, to enjoy this thing that he says is the joy of your Lord. But we do not have to wait for the return of Christ to start experiencing the joy of the submissive mind. How do we know that? Verses 17 and 18 in our text tells us this, that joy is a present reality and it comes through sacrifice and service. Listen to 17 and 18 again. Yes, and if I'm being poured out, Paul talking here, as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, notice he's saying this, if I'm being sacrificed, if my life is being taken to me because of the service of, for God, then he says this, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, verse 18, you also be glad and rejoice with me. I'm glad and rejoice. You should be glad and rejoice. Paul is saying here the joy, that joy is a present reality when we submit to God and it comes through sacrifice and service. It is remarkable to think that in two verses that discuss sacrifice, Paul uses the words glad and rejoice and repeats them in both verses. You see, most people would associate sorrow with suffering, but Paul sees suffering and sacrifice as doorways to a deeper joy in Jesus Christ. Did you get that? Most people would associate sorrow with suffering, but Paul sees sorrow, suffering and sacrifice as doorways to a deeper joy in Jesus Christ. As we wrap up this part of our lesson, hopefully next week, I think, we're going to try to get through the remainder of chapter two. We're at least going to give it a really hard try. Uh, but before we do that, let me close this up, this lesson tonight, with a few uh, important things, okay? Number one is this. Life is not a series, and I want you to grab this. Life is not a series of disappointing ups and downs. Rather, it is a sequence of delightful in and outs. God works in us, and we work out from that relationship. So God works in, and we work out. Okay? Life, instead of ups and downs, is a sequence of in and outs. God works in us, and we work out. God works in, we work out. Number two, the example comes from Christ. We found that in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. The example comes from Christ. The power comes from the Holy Spirit, verse 13. And the result is joy, verses 17 and 18. Did you get that? Let me give it to you one more time. The example comes from Christ, chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. The power comes from the Holy Spirit, verse number 13. And the result is joy, verses 17 and 18. So your homework is this. It's at the bottom of your study guide, second page. Which one of these truths will I apply this week and how? Which one of these truths will I apply this week and how? Okay? Pray with me right now, and I want to pray with you, for you, and over you. But pray with me right now. Will you just pause right where you're at, wherever you are, your living room, on the job, sitting out in your car, uh, maybe at the gym working out while you're listening to this, wherever you're at. Pray with me now. Let's ask that the joy of God would be ours as we submit ourselves to Him. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. We're grateful for you and everything about you. I ask you, God, that you'd help us in these first 11 verses to hear these commands of what we're to do, to hear this call to have the same mind that is in your son, Jesus Christ. And about doing those things, God, though we sacrifice and though we serve you, God, that we will discover the true joy that is found only in a relationship with you. And we thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen.
and amen. God bless each and every one of you. I apologize that I could not be with you live tonight. I do appreciate you staying with us on the video, though it wasn't live, uh, believing that God's going to use each and every one of these teachings. Every time we gather together, use our time together in God's word to change your life. So on behalf of our incredible pastor, Dan Wakefield, and his lovely wife, Esther, and myself, we want to say thank you for being a part of these Bible studies. We want to say thank you that we have the privilege of serving you, and we also are inviting you, asking you, join us this Sunday for a series of incredible services where God will not only change other people's lives, but we're hoping you will come in an anticipation that God will change your life also. God bless you. Have a marvelous rest of your evening, day, whatever time it is that you're watching this video, but may the blessings of God's be yours. God bless you. Have an awesome time. See you soon. Join us Sunday. Don't forget, I'm preaching. I'm excited about it. Love to see you. Bye now.